He's uh, in the state of Wisconsin, where we're both from. He's probably our most respected coach in the state. He's respected nationally, but more than that, he's just he's, a, he's an all-around good guy, and he's a good coach, and he treats his players fair. And with that, I'm just going to leave it up to John. Here's John. I appreciate it. Um, like you said, um, like Tom said, um, I guess he discovered me as a player, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't thank him. thank him for giving me an opportunity to play on his All Star team first of all, uh, and and then just staying with me all these years and, and helping me with with coaching and and uh, you know because most of us were players and before we became coaches we wanted to be players and uh, when you stop playing it's hard. Uh, but when you have good people giving you advice, um, you know, you, you get the right direction. So thanks, Tom. I also want to thank the EBCA for having me here. And uh, I do want to start, hopefully, uh, um, just with a question. Okay, you guys all are all, all familiar with uh, with the Dead Sea. Dead Sea? Middle East? You guys got that? All right, so I'll buy the beer for you if, if you could tell me why that's so relevant when I'm speaking about Tom O'Connell. Yeah. Why is the Dead Sea relevant when I'm talking about Tom O'Connell? Because when Tom started coaching, it was only sick. Dead Sea was only sick when he started coaching. <laughs> but it's been dead for a while, so uh, no. Um, I was talking to my good friend IG here from Belgium. He said, you know, sometimes you go to these clinics and you don't learn a lot. Um, but I want to I wanna give you one thing you're going to never have heard up until today. Right now, you're going to hear the first time ever something that's going to stick with you for a long time. We talk about being present in baseball, right? Being mentally present each and every day. All right, here's how you remember. This is what you tell your players. Be where your balls are. Be where your balls are. Where are your balls? They're right here, hanging right below you. Where you got to be, you got to be right here, right now, every single part of the day, right? God, that's a horrible thing to think about. But you will remember this for the rest of your life, won't you? But that's what baseballs are about, being, being where you are, all right? Um, I also had another great teacher. Uh, how many of you guys know Charlie Green Sr.? You guys know Charlie Green. Um, not only a great coach, uh, but a tremendous person. And I first met him in 2004 in the airport. He and I were on a... On a uh, a trip together, and he had this bag with a bunch of pickoff books. Some of you guys probably bought that book at some point. But of course, um, my parents always told me to respect my elders. He looked a little older than me. Um, and so I said, Coach, can I grab your bag? He said, no, 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 don't grab I said, no, Coach, really, let me grab your bag. So we walked through the airport. I, I was holding his bag, and we were talking. And, uh, and I said, uh, I've heard a lot about you, Coach, and it's, it's an honor to be with you. And he said, wow, that's really nice. What, what have you heard? And I said, well, I heard you're really an old school coach. And some of you guys know what I mean, right? Old school coach. There's new school, old school. And, and he said something that I think is relevant to all of us today, right now, which is he said, I don't know if I'm old school or new school, but I know I have to stay in school. And when I think about getting together today with all of you, that's what this is about. There's really... There's really just a couple things, right, why we're here. And let me start with that. Why are we here? We're here, I think, for four reasons. Number one, we're here because um, we want to learn something new. Andre, thank you. All right. Steve Springer, thank you, because I've already learned something new. All right. That's one of the reasons we're here. All right. Second of all, we're here to reinforce and recreate something we already know. I think I knew a lot of the stuff you were talking about, Steve. Somehow, somewhere, I might have heard it once before. But you know what he helped me do? He helped me to reaffirm I know it. He, he helped me to understand it's important. And he helped me recreate it in my mind so I can represent it to my team. That's important. But there's two other things we're doing here. All right? We're creating a network. 
I stand before you and I'm telling you I am not the source of great pictures. I am not the source. But I can serve as a resource for you, as you can serve for me. So our third reason for being together is really to create this network. I mean, three years ago I meet this guy, IG. A bunch of years ago I meet Steve. You know, I now meet Andre. What a, what a great group of people. I had heard a lot about Steve back there, Spring, as they call him, uh, from a good friend. But look, not only are they my friends, not only are they passionate about what I think is America's, or our best game ever, not just America's game, the world's game now, um, and I can call them and I can ask them, hey, what do you think about this? Help me get through this. And so I promise to you I'm now uh, one of the resources, hopefully, that you have. And then finally, the most important thing, you guys, any of you guys have a schedule? What's, what's next? Who's, who's speaking next? Move on. Where are we at? Yeah. So we're here to have fun. Look, if you guys don't think it's fun being around this game, just do what I did out of college for four years working in the private sector. I had a shirt and a tie on every single moment of the day. And at the end of the day, I got the fortune of doing and working with either a little league team or something like that. I was just happy to get my tie off and, and get back in the dirt. So let's go do that together. I also want to say this. I have had a lot of success, but it's not because of me. All right? I'm a small piece in a bigger puzzle. So as I look at it, remember, coaches, talent does matter. It really does. The next time you're beating yourself up about, God, I can't get him to throw the way I want to throw, remember, talent does matter. All right? And, and if I was given a speech on, on the mind or the mental side of things, I would tell you that's one of, for me, one of the big three. Number one of the big three mental cues for our team is don't worry about things you can't control. You can't control their talent level. Our job is to do the most we can with the talent we're given. Now, can you recruit? Of course, I get a chance to recruit. That's, that's a really special thing. But understand, most of you don't recruit. So when they show up today uh, for practice, it doesn't matter to me. God, are they 6'6 runner? I know that I have to do my job to be the very, very best for them. I need to develop them and give them a chance to keep playing this game. So let's start. I'm here to talk about innovative ideas of pitching. The word innovative, wow, I don't know. I hope you've seen some of this, all right? Because if you pay attention, it wasn't an original thought for me. Most of these things, um, Steve, you said to me at lunch, after I gave you credit one time, then it's mine, right? So I've given most of these people credit one time, but now it's mine. So what are our goals of the program, all right? First of all, this is the big one, man. Um, as a college coach, I can tell you sometimes um, I'm a little disappointed in the Internet. You know why? Because there's a lot of people selling their, their product on the Internet, and they want money for it. I'm here for free. You don't have to pay me a dollar, all right? And you know what? At the end of the day, the things we do ultimately try to win games and develop talent. That's why we're here. Okay? But on the Internet, this is the biggest piece of the puzzle. It's the one quantifiable thing we can work for. Velocity. Every one of your players and their parents, what do they want? To throw harder. You can go on the Internet and you can see a bunch of players at every ranch and every farm and every development place in, in the world and they're throwing the heck out of that ball into a net running 120 feet and then it says 100. That's a little bit different than when you have the bases loaded, Steve, and now he's got a pitch. Completely different thing. But I understand it matters. And our program is going to hopefully develop it. Since I've been in, in, at Whitewater, I uh, got there in 99, 2000. Uh, we've tracked every pitcher when they come in as freshmen and when they leave. So that means 17 years old to 23. And this is what you'll see out of the average guy, three to six miles an hour in velocity. So if that's true, we need to know where it comes from. So where does it come from? Andre, it's not magic. Those guys that are selling on the Internet are, is not magic. You can't just go to the store, pick up some weighted balls, and then go and throw, and then all of a sudden you're throwing 100. If it was that easy, we'd all be doing it. So where does it come from? 
It's not a surprise. It's not a. a it's not magic. It only comes from two places, I believe. Where are they? Mechanical adjustment, efficiency, and functional strength. That's it. Either you're doing something better, and your your body's unlocking better, or you lack functional strength, flexibility, stability, and now you understand. And now you have. It. That's it. That's it. It's not. It, there's nothing else. What else could there be? It's either mechanical efficiency or functional strength. That's it. So our program is going to hopefully help you become mechanically better. All right. Improve command. What's the difference between command and control? Who's going to help me? How many of you have dogs? When you say sit, and they sit, that's a command. How long does it take them to sit? Like that. That's a command. Control is like they stay in the house, right? They don't escape. They don't go to the bathroom all over your house. That's just control. Command is they do exactly what you want when you want to do it. If you're from Milwaukee or ever visited Milwaukee, we have a great team there. They're now in Atlanta. They're called the Braves. They're a World Series champ years ago. We have the Brewers, and we respect the Brewers, but back in the day, uh, back when, when Tom was growing up, there was a great pitcher by the name of Ron, Ryan uh, Warren Spahn. This is what he said about command. I want to be able to hit a gnat's ass from 60 feet 6 inches. That's a mosquito. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to not walk someone. We're trying to hit a gnat's ass from 60 feet 6. That's what we're doing. So when I talk about command, it's not control. It's command. Okay. He also went in, he talks a lot about deception. Once again, I'm going to go to the olden times, you know, when Tom was a kid. If you saw a baseball card from like the 50s or 60s, and it was a pitcher, you'd probably see him like this. He'd be all up here with his arm way bound in here. And what, what's he doing? Because they understood the importance of deception. Deception comes from three spots, right? It comes from movement, a change in speed, and physical body movement that leads you to deception. What do I mean by that? Tall right-handed thrower, front side's open, arms coming out at a three-quarter arm slot, that's easy for a hitter. What hitters don't like is they don't like a close front side on their approach, they don't like a guy who has movement, they definitely don't like a guy who closes a uh, change of speeds, all right? So, and they definitely don't like a guy who once in a while might throw it at their nose. So. When it's all said and done, they, these are our goals. They're pretty clear. We want to help them improve velocity. We want to help them improve command. And we want them ultimately to be able to deceive the hitter, right? Everything we do should be helping us here. And what does this all lead towards? Getting the guy out. That's why, as hard as it is for me to say this, because it's the one quantifiable objective, Velocity, as far as I'm concerned, is the least important of all of those. Let's talk about a couple basic concepts before we get into pitching. And I know we got Steve talking about pitching, so I'm going to hopefully keep it pretty, pretty simple. Momentum. We all know what it is. Momentum equals mass times velocity. What is mass? Just take the M away, and we got it. The bigger one, the better. There we go. Mass times velocity gives us momentum. We understand what it is. It's speed and direction. You want to throw harder? We need to create momentum from a dead stop. we got to create momentum down the hill. Think about it. What's your outfielders do to throw? They do something called the crow hop. What's an infielder do? He creates momentum. What's a pitcher's best friend? Momentum. Second kind of leverage. We all know what leverage is. Uh, I need a volunteer. Terry. Come on up. We're going to give them a little lesson on leverage. You're going to do this with your player. All right. This car right here is your car, or this desk is your car. Just ran out of gas. you got to push it from here to Budapest. Get on. Stop. Okay. Is your right-handed throw or left-handed throw? Right hand. Okay. Put your hand up. Tuck your glove. That's all. 
And now what do you got? You got a pitcher. <laughs> Why is every great pitcher getting this position? Because they understand leverage. What is the first thing he did to create leverage? He put his body in a position for a positional advantage. That's what pitchers do every single time. He went like this. Ask your player to do that. Then put his glove up and his arm up. And what's we, what do we have? We got a pitcher, don't we? Second concept. Got to know it. Third concept. Release point sequence timing. This is a really <coughs> hot button topic. A lot of, a lot of coaches <coughs> tell me you can't, you can't have a repeatable release point. I know this. If you go to every little youth game in, in the world, tell me this isn't going to happen. Johnny's going to throw a ball. Ball's going to be high. And someone's going to yell, follow through. Grab some grass. Grab some dirt. Right? Look, I'm going to tell you something. This is your one moment. This is your, how many seconds do we have to pay attention? Eight? eight. Ready? Here's our eight seconds. Here's what I'm going to tell you. The minute you let go of the ball, you can't do anything again. Doesn't matter. Let's just look at this for a second. If the ball's high, where's my hand? It's back. If my ball's to the right, that means my front side's closed, my arm's back. If I've thrown left, it's because I've pulled my front side out and I've taken my arm with it. Everything that happens is a combination between release point, sequence, and timing. What do I mean by timing? How the body works together. Easiest example. Why do you trip? You either make the wrong movement or you make it in the wrong sequence. Right? When I walk and trip, why did I trip? I either made the wrong movement with the, my foot or my feet went too quickly and I had the wrong sequence. Pitching is the same. When you're out of sequence, we have problems at release point. You will never hear me say stay back because what was my first thing we're trying to accomplish? So how do we stay back and create momentum? You can't, so I won't say it, ever. I will tell them to get back in sequence. I will tell them to get to their checkpoints on time. Those are things that I think are very good. All right. Um, got a couple other things. Shortening the curve. You have X number of minutes of, in, a, in a practice. Our job is to get that athlete on that learning curve as quickly as possible. The better we are at that, the quicker they learn. The quicker they learn, the quicker they improve. The quicker they improve, the better we are. The better we are, the more wins I have. I have them for four years. After the fourth year, they graduate. I got to shorten the curve. Number two, what's a bottleneck? Or who's my production? Anyone in the business sector build anything or understand production terms? Anyone? What's a bottleneck? <coughs> Do you know that term? When you try to put a lot of things through a small iteration. Yeah, so, so in the production world, if I'm building something, it's the, it's the point in the production process that slows things down, right? So if, if I got to move this base over here, and then someone else has to paint the base, but now there's a pile of bases here because this guy takes so long to paint, what's the bottleneck? The painting. So what's the bottleneck in teaching pitching? What's the li what limits us? Health of the arm. Absolutely. Health of the arm. Because if, if we could throw 1,000 balls with focus and purpose, we'd get better, quicker. But we can't do that, can we? Because we're going to kill their arms. So my job as a coach is to find other ways to get them on that curve. And I'm going to show you those. And then finally, I'm sorry, finally, efficiency of time. IG, you and I just spoke about this, didn't we? Everyone, probably at your level, is, is practicing about the same amount of time, isn't it? What's a, what's a typical amount of time you're going to have a, one of your athletes per week? 20 hours, 15 hours, Tuesday, Thursday for three hours each day, that's six. On the weekends, another three, six. So you got 10 hours. Does everyone that you compete with have about the same amount of time? So it's about you and being efficient with your time. Every, every, the coaches that are efficient with their time are the winners. That's the bottom line. That's the game. It's, it's, it's a space race, isn't it? 
I got four years. I got to develop them. I got to get them better. I got to keep them healthy. Arm care. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've all heard of it, right? We all got to do something to take care of our arms. This is a whole hour seminar just on itself, okay? Um, this is one of our athletes. I'm going to just take you through a couple of our exercises. I want you to get very educated on it because when it's all said and done, you're going to be able to do it. So this is just guy doing our activation set, and there's a bunch of different things. He's up in our field house. We got these blue bands. We got yellow bands. We got orange bands. Okay, and he's just focusing only on the shoulders right there, and he's doing a lot of posterior pulls. All right, and the goal of it is simply to warm things up. He takes the other set of bands, which are at a little different angle. Okay. Now he's doing ex external rotation at 90 degrees, but he's doing a pull to start. He's moving what we call victory pull. And you can see our practice facility behind there. It's, it's, it's a great place to be. We've got a lot of opportunity there for our athletes. This is just a incline ch chest press. Once again, all we're trying to do is warm up our bodies. Um, one last one. All right, this one I'm simply going to tell you. Okay, because once again, this could be an hour. We use most of our modified movements come from a packaged item, all right, already. It's called crossover symmetry. You can buy it, you can package it, and it's pretty good. Our athletic trainer supplements that in a big way. Our strength coach supplements that in a big way. This is what I'm going to tell you. Number one, there has to be a warm-up piece or an activation piece. There should be a recovery piece, which helps them get recovered, and then there should be a stability, strength, and flexibility piece. Whatever program you guys choose to do, and I can think it can be started at a very young level, be consistent with it, do your work on it, and don't take a lot of your time to do it, all right? Because this is not going to win you a game, but it will hopefully teach them how to make some movements. We can even go old school, can't we? The, uh, you can get a sand in a tennis. There's a lot of different ways. Internet, tons of internet. Don't need to go over the whole program, but I just need to know it's part of what we have to do. Med ball series. We try to teach explosion through the med ball series. This is a guy by the name of Austin Jones. Um, he tops out at 95 miles an hour, all right? On his third pitch of his junior year, which was clocked at 95 miles an hour, he threw out his ulnar ligament. He's now recovered. He's back up to a velocity of about 92 miles an hour. Um, it, as you see him go through this, I think what you'll see is he's not as explosive as he needs to be. And I think it's just, once again, getting back to not wanting to explode like he once did. Um, so we do a number of med ball series drills. What's the goal? The goal is to cheat the curve, right? These are movements that apply to pitching. Otherwise, we wouldn't do them. This is just a very easy warm-up. It's called a face-off, and he's just doing it both sides. We will emphasize a good turn, all right? We'll emphasize a good push press out to his toes. We go to a split squat position. Once again, we're maintaining stability in the bottom half while getting a good turn, throwing the med ball. He'll do that numerous times. My point in showing this to you these are the five activities we do almost daily. Go on the internet, do your research, find the ones that work for you, and integrate them into your program. Now, if you watch this, strides too short, all right, he doesn't get into the legs enough. There's a lot of things we can work on here. This is a 
straddle drill or just having him finish like a pitcher. Finish up like a pitcher. Going to move into what's called a this is a straddle drill, and then it'll go to a step back. And all we're trying to do is get him off his backside. We're trying to get him to explode. We're trying to get him to fire. We're trying to get him to finish like a pitcher. Is he finishing kind of like a pitcher? Yes. Right? That's our goal. Once again, I could give you, we have a series of 100 explosive med ball exercises we do that we believe can help shorten that curve, okay? These five we do almost every day, and typically we do it at a, a little better intensity than what you're seeing there, okay? In addition to that, these exercises are done at a six kilo, all right, ball, okay? And we'll do that early on out because when do you get hurt? Do you get hurt when you're moving slowly or when you're moving quickly, right? guy like Chris Stassi never could get hurt running because he doesn't go fast enough. Okay. But sprinters get hurt a lot, right? So early in our process, we'll be using a six, six uh, kilo ball. But as we get closer to our season, we'll, we'll change the weight of the ball, go in a lighter ball, more <coughs> explosive movements, quicker movements. All right. That, once again, our goal at that point is speed, 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 speed. Okay. Any questions at this point? Arm care med ball series. How long are we at that? 30 minutes max. We can accomplish both of those things in 30 minutes. Yes? And you told him, uh, he, he said he, his, uh, uh, his step and his, uh, his feet weren't wide enough. And would, would you rather have all the pitchers go to their natural stance while pitching and then do the exercises <coughs> to get comfortable in their yeah, and, and I guess I, I'm going to quote. I'm going to quote a guy. I'm not going to worry too much about stride length. I was looking at effort. I was looking at him, and I could tell he wasn't really giving me his all. What we're ask, a, asking of him is to throw the med ball as fast as he can at a 45 degree down angle, one bounce to either the wall or partner. We also can gun that to see his intensity. I'm looking intensity more than anything else. He ultimately will have to get to his maximum stride length. So I'm not telling them it needs to be here or there or wherever, but I do know that, that the biggest uh, way of throwing harder, especially for young kids, is going to be to increase the positive momentum from the leg drive. All right, that, I believe with that 100%. But we can hopefully get that through asking him to accelerate the ball as quickly as possible. I think his body will naturally make some of those adjustments, but great question. I do believe in stride length. I think young, young pitchers are going to, they like it nice and easy and soft. I think we have to teach them how to use their legs properly. Focus and purpose, really quickly, focus and purpose. Everything we do has to have focus and purpose, all right? <coughs> I show you that something you can make yourself. You know why I know that? Because I've seen more cows there than in Wisconsin. These are cow mats. They're rubber cow mats. They used to be used in the milking process. Okay, cows sit on there, they milk the cow mats. These are cow mats. They're four feet by six feet. I painted the dots on them, I hung them on a piece of wood, and they hang on our fence. Why is that important? It's important because we don't have that many catchers. And I never want how many catchers we have to limit what we do. So getting back now, focus and purpose. My good friend Charlie Green used to tell me, Bo, you cannot work accuracy, command, and mechanical adjustments. Think about that. You're working with a young guy. You say, throw a strike. You tell him, make a change. He makes the change, and the ball is thrown high. What's he thinking? You are a moron. That didn't work. That didn't work. And you know as a coach that he didn't do it exactly how you wanted but he's always going to revert back to his comfort range. That's why early in the development process, don't worry about the accuracy. Don't worry about the command. Anywhere on the mat is good. Just hit the mat. Hit the mat. 
as they get comfortable and feel the adjustments we're trying to make, now we can start saying, throw a strike inside of the dots. And then where are we ultimately trying to get to? Hit the gnat's ass from 60 feet 6 inch. But what we can use these for almost every activity we do. We don't need to, we don't need a catcher. We don't only have to do it when we're throwing a bullpen. We can throw to these mats all the time. All the time. Something that you guys can make. Um, I also tell you a couple other of my theories, my beliefs. Um, I believe that when you're teaching pitchers, you should be throwing a, a, a minimum of 50% fastballs. Okay? But you do have to throw the other grips because otherwise they're never going to get So everything we do, every time we're playing catch, every time we're throwing, every time we're doing a drill, we're going to change grips. We're going to use a change of grip. We're going to use a breaking ball grip. We're going to use a fastball grip. We're going to use a split finger grip. Now, once again, if, if your kid is eight years old, then we're throwing one grip probably, right? But as they get older into high school and, you're, and they're ready, they need to throw the grips. They need to feel the grips. And the only way we do it, if the only time they're throwing a curveball is in a game or in a bullpen session, then we're going to have a feel problem. So 50% of the time we're throwing fastballs. The other 50%, we're going to throw off-speed pitches. What off-speed pitches they throw, that's up to you as a coach. Okay? Second of all, we're always going to throw more throw throws to our glove side than our arm side. That's my belief. Why? I think it's harder for a right-handed pitcher to get glove side than a left-handed pitcher to get glove side than it is to throw arm side. I think this arm slot is easy. I think that's easy for most of my pitchers. That's what I've seen throughout the years. I think getting across the plate is tougher. So if it is tougher, and we know that's important, if I right-handed hitter, right-handed pitcher, and I'm going to throw him away, and I know that when I'm trying to throw the five zone, the ball's coming across the plate, and that's what's getting hit, then i got to spend more time making sure I can get there. How do we get there? Once again, make sure you maintain the ratios. If I'm going to throw 100 throws into the mat, 50% of them are, are going to be fastballs. The other 50% the other can be changed any sequence any way you want. And we can, sequencing is another 45 minute discussion. We can either throw fastball, 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 change of breaking ball, or we can maybe pin three breaking balls in a row if we're trying to create feel. Once again, that's going to be a personal preference up to you. Weighted balls. How many of you guys are into this now? Familiar with this, okay? Um, don't ever do anything because someone tells you to do it, unless they tell you why, and you believe it. All right? I believe in, in the use of weighted balls. Probably not. I don't believe it's as, it's as simple as throw these balls and here's your sheet and I'm going to follow the sheet and I'm going to throw the balls and I'm going to just throw gas. By the way, you guys know how you got to throw gas, right? What do you need to throw more gas? You got to use your ass, right? And if you want to throw hard, you really got to throw hard. You got to try to throw hard, don't you? So I like the radar gun in bullpen sessions to see where they're working at. A lot of pitchers always are saving. Got to save it. Always save it. You never know. I might have to throw. Like in a week, I got to save my arm. I got to save my arm. At some point, if you want to throw hard, you got to throw hard. And if you want to throw gas, you got to use your ass. Your butt. Either way. All right, so we do use weighted ball drills. Um, I'm not going to show you this because it's, I don't know, maybe two sessions, Steve, on this one. Maybe five sessions on this one. This is what I believe. From what I, what I can research, the principles are sound. I think some underloading and overloading is good. I think you've seen it in track for a long, long time. I remember back in the day when I was an athlete, which was not as old as when they used to pull them behind the Model T. Uh, we still had normal cars, but they used to pull the sprinters, you know, on a, on, on, a, on a rope, a tether, to get them to cycle their feet faster. Well, how do you do that? You underload the ball. Okay. So I believe that under, underweight balls and overweight balls can help you. I also believe that, um, that they uh, help you feel adjustments quicker, all right, because ultimately I want my pitchers to be able to make adjustments. So if I throw a ball at two different weights to that wall, first one I throw is going to be where I need it to be. The next one, because it's a change of weight, adjusts everything. So how quickly can you make that adjustment and get back to throwing strikes? And I also think the third benefit of throwing weighted balls, I think 
sometimes the overload allows you to feel any improprieties in your, in your, in your process and also will force your body to compensate naturally. So both, for those reasons, I think it's a good program, but I'm not going to show it to you and say, go do it. I'm going to tell you, do your work. Find one that you like. Do the research on it, and then go. If you, if you need to talk about it, I'm your resource. I'm one of many resources. But here's why I will tell you. We all know what a football is. I believe that throwing footballs is a, a critical part of what we do. Now, I make some adjustments. First of all, I go with a junior size football, a youth football. Why? Because I don't want the size of the hand to change the movement pattern. So I go with a smaller football, okay? All right, because a lot of our guys never thrown a football, okay? But here's the deal. Throwing is throwing, okay? John Elway, former quarterback, great pitcher at Stanford. Dan Marino could throw the heck out of the ball. He was a catcher quarterback, all right? Uh, um, recently, we had a, a, a great guy um, who was the quarterback for Seattle Seahawks, drafted and great pitcher, all right? So throwing is throwing. The other thing I want uh, you to know that if you watch, how many of you guys watch football? I mean, not much, I know, but it's out there, right? If you ever watch a football quarterback throwing, <coughs> this is what you'll see. He always goes like this. He always will just tap that ball. He'll just tap the ball, and then that will start his sequence. If you've watched the Cubs, you'll see Jake Arrieta do the same thing. Then he types and goes. Because it's all about timing and sequence. So throwing is throwing. And here's the other great thing about football. I don't think, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think a, a quarterback has ever had Tommy John surgery. He's never needed it because the arm never moves fast enough. So it's not a recovery issue. It's not something you can blow your arm out in. You can, they, they've never said, hey, we got to give the quarterback like four week, four days off before he throws again. If you're a quarterback, you throw every day in practice. You throw 250 balls. In, if you're a throwing quarterback, 250 a day. Your arm doesn't fatigue. Why? Because it's not moving as fast. So if we can help them learn to throw better, I like it. Why else do I like the football drill? Because when you hold a football, it's held just like a breaking pitch is without even knowing you're holding it similarly to a breaking pitch. So, those are my reasons. Here are the drills. First one's face off. This guy's also a 90 plus thrower. I hope both he and the last guy got an opportunity, will get an opportunity this year to play at the next level. Next drill here, throwing foot forward. I call it a oppo split squat. So now we're just emphasizing a good turn, good separation, and taking care of it. Now we go to a straddle drill. All right, he's just straddling. He's moving back and forth a little bit. We're not trying to throw it as hard as we can. So once again, it's just a straddle drill. Now we're doing a three-step drop drill. And all I want to do is I want him to move his feet. And the most important thing is when he finally sets his backside leg, notice that he's getting off his backside moving forward because why? We always want momentum to the target. So what I don't want to see is I don't want him to see a three-step drop and then stay here and then take forever. The problem with a lot of pitchers is they think pitching should be slow and easy. It's not slow and easy. right? So it's a three-step drop. I want to see that. That's what I want to see. Boom. Get things going that way. So once again, what can we use? We use we use bands, we use med balls, we use footballs. We use dowels. Alright, what's a dowel? It's a piece of wood. How long is it? Two feet long. Two feet. Um, two feet. Less than a meter. Right, this far is shorter than a meter. Right, how many? Sixty centimeters? Sixty centimeters. How, uh, how wide is it? Like a pencil. Maybe a little wider than a pencil. Go to a store, buy it, put some tape on the bottom, and they hold it in their hand. This is the most important thing. When you hold the dowel, it should be an extension of my arm. The only way I can move that dowel is by bending my wrist. Or bending my elbow. 
Because here's, I'm going to tell you something that was told to me years ago, before everyone thought that throwing 100 was going to be possible. But people that throw hard are going to be utilizing all of the leverage pieces they have, which means you're going to see a bend in the wrist and a bend at the elbow. All right? If you want to throw hard, you need to get the forearm. It's got to get close to the upper arm. If you throw with a straight arm, not going to throw as hard. We need some flexion, all right, in those two pieces. This creates some of that flexion. The other thing it does, it cleans up all the arm stuff on the back side. Because if you, if you break in the wrong way, you're going to hit yourself with a piece of wood, all right? So it cleans up all the arm pad stuff, all right? And finally, it's a great way to warm up. It's light. After you warm up, you can hear it. It develops hand speed, but you can also use it between innings. Have your pitchers go down there. They can do their reps with the dial. So we're going to show you the series of dial drills. Face off position. By the way, we just put a uh, we put a two pound ball in the glove hand because with the glove, the glove restricts the dial. So we changed it and we put a two pound ball in the glove hand, which also makes him feel the front side and take care of the glove. So this would be a chair drill, lift, gather, throw. Here's, here's what I believe sequencing wise. Even though I don't like stopping my guys in the middle of this piece, this is a checkpoint for them. When, when the hands start to separate, all right, the front hinge opens to the plate. All right, this happens here. And some guys are a little quicker, some guys are a little, but we have to understand that's the starting point here. When this goes, so on this, as the knees go up, hands go up, knees go, knee goes down, hands go down. All right, that's the starting point as far as sequencing goes. Okay, so how many are you going to do? Yes. John, did you mention the, the sound again? Yeah, yeah, you sh it's a whipping sound. I mean, you'll, it's like a whip. That's what you should hear. It's like a wooden whip, wooden dowel. And you'll hear that thing going. The guys that throw harder, you'll hear it. Guys that throw soft, you won't. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, pretty simple. And, and, and they'll, they'll try to compete to hear it because they know what it sounds like on a daily basis. All right, now we got this, uh, this one here. This is the backside power. All we're trying to do is get them over his front side. Pretty simple drill. All right. Just trying to get him to turn without pulling off his pitch. Eyes in the target. So really quickly, I'll just tell you my verbal sequencing. Not everyone's a verbal learner, but some are, so we, we always maintain it. All right, so it starts at separation. Separate, elevate. Front sides elevate. This, for me, is the key. If you don't elevate the front side, we lack deception. All right, so I'm going to separate the hands, elevate the front side. All right, now we're going to commit to throwing. Once we commit to throwing, it's going to be glove in the box, eyes in the glove. That's it. Glove in the box, take care of the glove, eyes in the glove. That's my, so every, every drill he does, that's what we're doing. The blue ball again, what's the blue ball for? This movement as a pitcher is not what we want. All right? We want them to secure the front side. This becomes an anchor point for us that we can throw around, okay? So that's what we're trying to teach them, not to throw this. Young guys, where are young guys going to do? They're going to try to throw this way. They think these two arms are connected like this, okay? But they're not connected. This stays here, that throws. So that's what we're trying to teach them. Why the cone? Why not go back to the chair? How do we teach a modified lift? That's how we teach a modified lift. I'm amazed at how many high school pitchers in the United States, maybe not in California, do not understand how to control a running game. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm surprised how many pitchers in the major leagues don't care about the running game. But you know why? 
Spring wide, because there's not a stat that helps me earn any more money with that, is it? Really. It's about ERA and whip and those kind of things. But how do your team win? When your pitcher controls the running game. Most important thing for me is how do we get to the plate? How do we throw the ball quickly to the plate without compromising our pitch? Do I want him to just throw it in there and let the guy jack it around? No, I want him to throw a quality pitch, but I want him to get to the plate quickly. How do I do that? It's by modifying his, his motion. How do we do that here in this drill? We simply add a cone. So that he knows that when that foot comes off the cone, we got to be gathered and we got to go. Right? He needs to get comfortable there. And he's doing it with a dial wire. Because we don't even have to throw a strike. Don't even have to throw a strike. He throws a strike every time. Towel drills. Going to go quickly through them. You all understand them. You've seen them. He's going to go through a couple. The first one is on one leg. He's going to work into it slowly. This is our first exercise out of the towel drills. Two, three. He'll keep going, and each one is going to ramp up in intensity. And towards the end here, he'll start maintaining his balance. Okay? Now you notice he has the lines on the ground. He's going to use that as a, as a reference point. Three lifts. He uses a full lift means his leg gets to the same height as it does in a wind position. The next one's going to be a, a smaller lift <coughs> with an OK runner on base. And then his last lift is going to be a quick lift, or what we call a glide step. That's, not, that's a half lift, and he'll have a glide step. Now, the great thing is, is I think pro baseball, and Steve, you can tell me, I think sometimes pro baseball is finally catching up with what I think's been going on in college for a long time. I think they really care about winning. And I think they, they found a way to coach their pitchers up. Because you know what I'm seeing more than ever? Maybe it's just a Latin influence. I'm seeing pitchers change their lifts, not really to control the running game, but for what? Interrupt time of the hitter. And it's effective, especially lefties. Lefty guys, he's one of these guys, and then he pitches and you're on time, and then all of a sudden he goes, boom, and he separates his feet and throws. God, my hitters hate it. They come back and they, he's quick pitching it. No, he's not really quick pitching. You have plenty of time to get ready. You haven't been paying attention. So absolutely, for me, multiple lifts for a pitcher is where we're trying to get to. Other pieces, really quickly. This does not mean the things you're doing shouldn't be included. A throwing series, some type of throwing for every day, is something that they're familiar with. Okay, flat work on a flat mound. Why? Why is why is flat work used instead of always on a mound? Less stress on the arm due to the loads going down the hill. Right? Because why? Because what are we creating less of? Momentum. But it, it, it has a place in your program. Bullpens. Absolutely, bullpens are important. Try to make them as competitive as possible. <clears throat> All right? Post-performance workouts. How many of you guys have a strength coach? After they're done throwing, they go report to the strength coach, and they say, Coach, I'm ready. Ready to go. Set me through this workout. Anyone? Yeah. Not us either. How many of you even have a gym near the field? You don't. So we have actually what's called a tire workout. It has a big old tractor tire. We have a sledgehammer. We do tire, tire lifts. We do tire rolls. We, we do uh, core strength stuff. And they know every day when they're done pitching, they go to that if, we're not, if we don't have access to a weight room. But they're going to do something. Okay. Bag of tricks. I didn't bring it due to the weight. But in each pitcher will have a bag. And in that bag will be the following. They will have a dowel. They will have a set of weighted balls. They will have a clean throwing bullpen ball. They will have a, another ball with a tape on the center line so they can see spin. They will have a hockey puck, and they will have two balls duct taped together to create spin on a breaking ball. All of that will be in their bag every, and a football. They will have all of that in the bag all the time. All right? 
and they take it everywhere they go, so no matter where we are, they can work at it. All right? Those, those <coughs> things are vital to what we do. Do we use each of them every day? No. What's the hockey puck for? Seeing spin, visualizing spin. What's the double ball for? Visualizing spin. And what's the, what's the ball with the line on it? <coughs> to see spin. Okay. Who knows? Let's, let's, let's talk. I believe, I hope I'm not, not wrong. I believe that you don't have to be a psychologist to be good with the mind. And I don't think you have to be a kinesiologist to be good with the body. That's what I hope. I think everything I've shown you today should make common sense. Because if it doesn't make common sense, how in the heck are any of you guys going to use it? Because how many of you guys have a degree in kinesiology? Maybe one? <laughs> Two. You guys are good coaches. The rest of you guys are screwed. All right? But I do believe that you have to kind of get the game and understand the game and try to apply it in the most common sense way. Like pushing a car to me is a great example of leverage. Using multiple sports, for example, a finish of a, a finish of a, 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 either a shot putter or, or a javelin. You guys have seen that. Your kids and your kids' parents have seen that more than a pitcher, right? How do they finish? Do you ever see a, a javelin guy go like this? And why in the hell do I see all our pitchers finish? Like, how, do, how does he finish? Right? And that's how every major leaguer finishes. After they do that, then they do that. But that's not what our guys know. So we got to give them an example and show it to them. Questions? Nothing? Football sports. It's too far to pull the yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot, here's the other thing about, I think, if, about pitchers, I think they're really, really sensitive about it. They never think they're warmed up, right? They never think they're warmed up. Pitchers are never warmed up. They're like, oh, give me a couple more. We've been throwing for 45 minutes, you need a couple more. So, yes, I think it's always a good thing because for them mentally, they always need warm-up. So, uh, <coughs> dolls are a warm-up, towels are a warm-up. We finally then work to maybe the, the, the heavy balls, and we won't do that every day. We'll do it at a maximum three days a week, maybe every second day. But yes, great, great question. A lot of these can be used as a warm-up or a lead-up to actually throwing activities. I can tell you this, last thing. In a, in, a, in a routine day, if we have enough recovery time, they may do elements of everything I've shown you today and that entire list. I'd rather have them go through that with less pitches in each of those areas almost every day. So one, one practice might include um, arm care, med balls, footballs, weighted balls, throwing progression, dowels or towels. I mean, we'll add a lot of them because otherwise pitchers are just standing around. Those of you guys that have multiple position guys, a lot of those guys exist. I always think it's important for them to, to, to find their own time to do it. So that meaning, if you're starting practice at 5, bring them in at 4.30. Bring them in at 4. you got to be there. You're the guy. They need time with you. All right? Those people that are doing two things. They're probably your most valuable player. Right? Yeah, they're the athletes. So make time for those multiple position guys. I know... Tom used to have exceptional guys that went two ways, and, and you got to make time for those guys. So that's all I got, Tom. Yeah. Right. One question. One yeah, question. just one. It's not really a question. I want to add something. I mean, uh, when, when the question was, is that still a in the football, is that still a warm up? Um, I think one of the biggest things I've changed through the years is just the way of thinking. I mean, we all warmed up to throw. I mean, yep. we all threw the warm-up, let's put it that way, and I just made them think like, hey, we're going to warm up to throw. And that's totally different. I mean, if we work out, we have a 40, 45-minute warm-up before we pick up a baseball to throw. But we throw already weighted balls. Yep. We already throw weighted balls. And the thing is, 
I'd rather throw one kilo, one, a, a one kilo baseball before they picked up a ball and they're firing it. Because you know what? It can't hurt you because your body is built that way that will protect itself. Your body will never hurt itself. There's always this little thing in your brain that will keep you back and won't hurt you. So to throw a one kilo baseball is safer to throw than throw a five ounce baseball. So keep that in mind. It really worked out. And that's about a two pound ball. Yeah. Two point two pounds. So ball. that's I mean through the years, I mean guys that uh, and I gotta keep some wood, but the thing is, guys that did the type of program with me in the last seventy years, I didn't have one guy miss the start. One guy missed the start in seventy years. No yeah. army. If I could piggyback, um, just we're all in the same thing together except Springer. Hopefully Springer left. Look, just like here's the deal. You watch spring training, this is what you're going to see for their, for their pitcher's fielding practice. And then guess what happens? They don't need it until October. And then they can't do it. So, just why am I saying that? Because when it's all said and done, are you warming up? You're always warming up, but it's always cross facets, right? We're not only warming up. If you're doing it slow, like I can't. I mean, if we're throwing a football like, oh, I better not throw, then we're not getting there. We always have to be trying to work at slightly below game speed, right? I mean, at some point, if we're trying to get the body to fire, we have to fire it. So if they're just going through the motions because they don't feel they're warmed up, then that's not our goal. But we believe we can throw footballs at 100% velocity, and still it's a lead-up into what we're going to do. Uh, weighted ball, same thing. We can use that as a lead-up to the white ball. You know, and all pitchers in our program like nice white balls. They don't want it when they're pitching in a game, but for practice they want white balls. And I said, well, you don't get them here. So, anyway. One, one more thing. You can't move faster by moving slower. Let's think about that one in the next couple of hours. That's <laughs> philosophy. That's really deep. That's really right. deep. Steve. Like if you want to throw fat, fast, you've got to go fast. That's right. All right. Steve will have more of that deep stuff for you guys tomorrow. <laughs> John. John.